Romans, the ninth chapter, if you have your Bible, you can stand with us. The ninth chapter of Romans, the 20th through the 21st verse. Would you all stand? that are practice in your life. God is a good God. God is writing a good thing every day in your life. You ought to be thankful Thank you, Lord. for the life God is, has given you. We talked on last week the have and the have not. We want to conclude that message today without rushing. We want to get the Lord's Supper this. We serve a great God. You see that 20th chapter of Romans, the 9th to the 20th, 20th through the 21st. It says, Oh man. Romans 9, 20 through 21. Uh -huh. Y'all thought y'all were going to get out of church early. Oh, man. Who art thou that replies against God? Complaining with God. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me? Has not the potter over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel? unto honor and another unto dishonor. O man, who art thou that thou hast replied to God again how you made me? I made you. Don't you have the, the potter over the clay, all the same lump, one lump, but some you give to have, and you have the have not. You got the potter, you are the potter, you made me this way, and yet you took one clump of clay and you split it up but you gave some this and gave others that you may be seated cause it's in my mind that the purpose of this time of really sharing together is at once transparent and patently clear. It is also to affirm that God himself made us. He molded us and make us and hold us 
in his hands. It is affirmed here this morning that God himself made us and he molded us, make us, and hold us up in his hand. I'm aware, of course, that for the most mature Christian, those of us who've been on this journey a long time, I'm aware that the mature Christian is something about that affirmation that is not new to us. It does not break any new theological or philosophical ground. I'm also aware of it. Those who are veteran uh, soldiers of the cross, this uh, word which speaks of God intervention and unto human affairs and into our affairs is not some necessarily a word of fresh revelation. Because on one, the one hand, for those who may be interested, not only is who God is, but what God does. And why does he? It will also be important to remember that what I really seek to affirm is that God himself make us. He molds us and hold us up in his hand. Perhaps you have not considered the hands of God. Maybe you didn't, never thought about it. You haven't considered at all. Perhaps you have given little attention to the importance of the purpose of the hand of God. God's hands are indicative of his involvement in human affairs. God's hands are parabolic of his possessiveness and of his strength. God's hands are the paradigm of his presence in your life as well of the protector of your life. Somebody would agree with that God hand dug a representative of his action as well as his authority and his anatomy. It further where God holds us up with his hand, God shelters us in the deep places of the earth. He makes room for us in his hand. God protects the sheep of his pasture, and he holds them all in his hand. God protects the sheep, I said, of his pasture, and he holds us in his hand. He scoops out the valleys and he mold mountain. He hold the universe in balance of his grace. He keep us and keep nature also in harmony with the holy and then turns around and measure the whole of the cosmos by the plumb line of his justice and his judgment, and he holds them all in his hand. David suggests to us, even if you take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part 
of the sea, even there, his hand will lead me and his right hand will hold us up. Ezekiel discovered that when the hand of the Lord was on me, he developed a strange and unique preaching power that enabled even the dry bone to hear the word of the Lord. There is just something strange about his hand. As he hung down on the cross, Calvary's tree, he was heard to proclaim, Father, into thy hand. This discussion came up in Romans, the ninth chapter. This discovered of use God make us with his hand was prompted in the main by a rather disturbing situation. Here in this eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, as a community of Christianity, Paul have come so far beginning with his insistence on the power of the proclaimed word of God. And he starts soaring to a new height, a new way he starts soaring because it was disturbing that here in the 8th chapter, his epistle to these Roman folks, those of you who've been in church for a long time, now uh, even this exuberant Paul is now rather uh, something that's sad and forlorn with Paul almost this this word of Paul, this integrativeness of this Taurus preacher, I hear him saying, has not the potter over the clay of the same lump of that one bowl, that same lump, he makes one vessel, you are a vessel. He made one fellow one way and another unto dismay. But suddenly they appear that there is a nameless, faceless someone with whom Paul is holding this conversation with. And the essence of his conversation is, is that the one whom Paul is speaking has suggested that God is not fair. What kind of God is this that is so discriminatory that he exalts some folks and bring others down low. What kind of God is this that is so mean some have and others have not. Thank you. I got an amen over there. Amen. God is not fair, yo. Hardy, are you over there? God is not fair. In the first instant, that argument is put forward that God is not fair because God has not kept his promise. Are y'all reading with me? God chose Israel through the process of a divine adoption. God showed Israel his glory in the cleft of a rock and protected them which is nothing but clay with the cloud of joy and a pillar by night, a fire by night, manna on the ground, gave them his covenant and his law, and God 
could be found in the temple worship in Israel with our forefathers, Israel, God promised that all of the nation of Israel will be blessed. But now it looks like God does not keep his promise. Thank you for that amen over there. Oh, I got some praying folks here. Paul is now preaching to a Gentile nation. You know you are Gentile. That's right. And uh, who are not Jews by birth, nobody I ever heard of other than uh, well, Sammy Davis Jr. wanted to be uh, a Jew. We're not Jew by birth. But we are those who now is claiming the promise Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are not the natural offspring of Abraham. Listen in with me. Come on up a little closer if you hear what I got to say. They're no longer talking about the children of Abraham. They're talking about the children of the promise. And they say, tell your neighbor, they say. they say. If somebody is getting something that we are not getting, if somebody is getting something that only we are supposed to get, that means that God has not kept his promise. Are y'all reading with me? And more than that, it means that God is not fair. God is not fair because uh, he obviously is biased and he discriminates against us. Are y'all in the building? I know you're listening. If you don't believe me, you ought to take a little trip here into Judaism and check some of the history. You see, Jacob and Esau had the same father. They were twin, but Esau was born, was born first. And as a consequence, Esau should have received the blessing. Are y'all really following me? Come on, somebody. And inheritance of the father. But in point of the fact, behold, how unfair can you get? Before they were born, God said, I'm older than he is. Shall I serve the younger? But not only that, God is so unfair that he let it be known that Jacob I live, but for Esau I have hated. God is unfair. All you have to do is read the scripture you will see how unfair God can get. Y'all mind? Get. In our life, the children of Israel was in bondage in Egypt. Don't let that pass you by. There they was, oppressed by the hard and cruel taskmaster. A new Pharaoh that arose in Egypt and knew not Joseph and as a result they worked until sun up to sun down to some more brick without straw somebody ain't listening to mid uh, mata without clay but not only that but this book says that God raised a Pharaoh and then harden his heart. Tell somebody, God raised up Pharaoh. 
it look like, it look as if Pharaoh is hard enough, uh, the heart uh, of his own, but then God got in it. God will get in it. Tell your neighbor, God will get in it. You be careful, be careful. And he was hardened, Pharaoh's heart, even the more. And then when somebody said, God, why did you do that to me? Uh, when something is asked of God, what do you have in mind uh, that make you treat us like you do? And that tornadoes all around the place. Folks are dying, losing their home. Folks living under the viaduct all along the high. When somebody raised the question of the inquiry, what is your plan? Have you ever thought about what is your plan? What is your purpose? What is your priority? Just down here, good for nothing? What are I will have complaints on whom this God talking, I will complain on whom I have compassion. And that's why this one against Paul or against this one against Paul. Paul is out there like him by himself. He uh, really railed this one toward whom Paul direct his message, his sermonic message suggests that Paul, God is not fair. There are some folks who treat you the same way. On your job, some people won't, wouldn't even been working with them for 30 years and they wouldn't even know if you're a Christian or not because we get quiet. The whole matter then is on the unfairness of God. It seemed like with all those earthquakes and folks, all those folks getting killed, dying, all of the killing on the school campuses, this one whole matter then of the unfairness of God. It seemed like God killed this one and God let that one live. It seemed to speak relevant and reasonable to our plight. It seemed to me there are some among us who would join in this accusation in your life. There are times I, I'm accusing and I'm that God is not fair. When life begin to turn upside down in your life, wish I had some amen. When life began to turn inside out, it seemed to look as if though that God has not kept his promise. Do y'all feel that way? When our burden press us down and when our burden become too heavy for us to bear. Somebody want us to know what God, what have you done for me lately? When it look like life is about us to leave our bodies and we have not reached the three score years. That's it. And 10, that's 70 something. It, sometimes it looks like God has not kept his promise. Y'all ought to move with somebody. Strangely, strangely, strangely enough that this word, strangely, it reaches us strange enough that we can apply to those who have. Uh, and for those who have not, I, I might want to remind you that Jesus, just before you love the Lord, that you won't be sheltered, that life trials and tribulations, just because you've joined the church 
and leave giving your life to the Lord. Uh, it does not mean that you're going to have a flowery bed of ease. With somebody, help me out. Because you joined the church and have given your life to the Lord does not mean that you're going to have a flowery bed of ease. Just because you've been born again and have given your life for the Lord doesn't mean that you won't have enemies on every hand. It does not mean that the hellhound won't trill. And when you go to church, y'all, that's this sad part. When you go to church, when you, you go to church and give your tithe and offering, and you've served and given your time, your talent, and you still don't seem to get any better in the church than you were in the world. You run around here in Vallejo and Fairfield so soon. Uh, you can't hide from God. There's a time when it looked like God is unfair what make it really seem though as God is unfair however is when that rascal of the world have everything let me say it like that and you ain't got nothing just look at Jacob who named me Supplanter. Are y'all familiar with Jacob? Come on, Brother Diggin, are y'all familiar with Jacob? Whose name was means Supplanter. One who really followed after Jacob. He's selfish. He's crafty. He's deceitful. He's deceptive. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He's an adulterer. Jacob. Deceptive. Jacob was all of that, y'all. He was all that and more. Yet Jacob got the blessing over Esau. And there are some, a whole lot of folks who had no good. And it seemed that they really still get the blessing. It seemed that there are times when a whole lot of folks just can't understand why God has nothing, nothing in your life. But I, I submit to you, God is still good. There was some. God is still making a way out of no way. God has done something in writing. He writes it every day. God writes each day in your life. Turn to your neighbor and I want you all to whisper this. How can I write and read and talk at the same time? You can believe this. Each day God is writing new things. Writing new things in your heart. Yes, Lord. In your what? And our years are the chapters that record his faithfulness. The record that he's been with you all your life. Every day. He makes a way for you when it seems there is no way. He 
turn the clouds to a sunshine. Don't worry about the flood. Pray for because God has it all in check. You ought to tell somebody he's still making ways. Somebody said, what has he done for me lately? You want to know what he done? He brought you when you couldn't bring yourself. He made a way when there was no way to be made. He picked you up, put your feet on a solid ground. What I like about it, he still. Somebody know what I'm talking Can I get a witness? I said he's still making a way Out of no way Father, they took him to the cross Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for your resurrection. This week, thank you for keeping us alive. Thank you for the privilege of prayer that we can come to you daily. All the minutes of our life we can touch you, you touch us. This treasure we have in trash, our mortal body, 
The power comes from God, not from me or you. We're torn all over, but we're not done yet because God has something for us. Father God, 